Which player are you most excited to watch this season? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. We've brought in... Uh, I'm really excited to see the new players, obviously. Um, and I guess just in terms of, if I have to say a player, I mean, Jan Kuba's, you know, been brilliant since he's come in. He's got that X factor. So um, I would say, having watched the, the first three games, you know, he's really exciting. But, you know, all of our new players are all quite very different. We're really looking forward to seeing them all. Obviously, some we haven't seen yet. And, um, and obviously, some of our players who've been here for a while also love to watch them. So I don't like to, to name players who've put me on the spot. So Jan Cooper it is. The fixture you most look forward to, and does it change ever? You know what, well, I love the Premier League. I love all the games. So I don't want to pick one in particular. Hopes for this season? Well, look, we've got the best squad of players we've ever had. And so we, we're not in Europe, which, which we're not happy with. We'd love to be in Europe, but it does give us a significant advantage against a lot of our rivals. And so we've absolutely got to be aiming to, to get back into Europe this season. Which other team do you think has had the best transfer window? I think Arsenal are an exceptional team and I think they've strengthened really well as well as obviously they've got Timber who's like a new signing for them. So I think they're going to be really, really tough to beat this season. So, you know, we, we've done exceptionally well to get a point at the Emirates on Saturday. Uh, but I think in, in, they haven't made too many signings, but the ones that they have, Marino, midfield, Sterling, you know, and the, uh, and the, and the left back as well, left centre back who yeah. came off the bench. He's, he's really good. So I, I just think they've got an exceptional team. Although Manchester City, obviously, are still the best team in the world and, and they're the ones to beat. Do you have a favourite away ground that you'd like to visit? For any reason, it doesn't have to be the football, it can be the hospitality. I would say, I mean, there's so many away grounds I enjoy going to and a lot of them are quite different. I do think Tottenham's new stadium is just a magnificent place to watch sport, to watch top level sport. So for that reason, I'll give it to Spurs. That's, that's that's the quick players out of the way. Okay, well, Tony, it's been a, a dramatic uh, transfer window and an exciting one for Albion fans. A very large number of exciting young players coming into the squad. The emphasis in the market seems to have changed. You've moved up in price, purchase price, up into that 20 to 40 million pound sort of bracket for several players. Can you just explain how the transfer policy has evolved this summer and why? Yeah, it's always an evolving process and at the start of the window I wouldn't have been expecting to sign so many players, so it's about circumstances. And I don't look at it as one transfer window, I always look at it multiple. And over the last few years, um, we've sold a lot of players and there hasn't always been the right time, the right players to bring players of, of, of a certain calibre in. And also circumstances whereby um, a lot of the Premier League clubs have got certain financial issues staying within the rules. So that comes into it. That certainly helped us when we purchased uh, Jan Kuber in, in, at the end of June. Um, and also I think a lot of um, big clubs on the continent don't have the resources of some of the Premier League clubs in terms of competing with Brighton for certain players. So there's more, there's availability. Some of the players we, we've brought in, perhaps in transfer windows gone, we wouldn't have been able to, to get them. So everything's aligned that we've obviously uh, spent a lot of money in transfer, transfer windows this particular season. I don't foresee that um, being the case over the next few transfer windows, particularly with the amount of young players we've got both within the squad and also investment players we've bought and have gone out on loan, really top, top young players. And on top of that, we've got some great prospects in our academy, some of them have now gone out on loan. And so we're in a really good shape because ideally we don't have to spend big money on transfer, transfer fees for players right now in the squad. But circumstances have been that this season it's all come together and we've bought a lot of expensive players who are into the first team squad straight away. Right, so this isn't the new normal, this is, this is a distinct set of circumstances that's led you to 
spend in this way, is that right? Yeah, just, you just got to be opportunist, opportunist, opportunistic and also, you know, looking at the circumstances at the time and, and looking at it over a two or three year uh, period when, you know, in that period, you look at the ins and the outs, it doesn't look anything too far different. It's just all happened in one small transfer window. Has the process of bringing players into the club become easier? There, there must, you must find that there's more of an appetite of people wanting to join the football club. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. We, we've had success in the Premier League. We've had success uh, qualifying for Europe and having a good European campaign uh, as well. And just the facilities here at the training ground are superb. The rep reputation we've got. And, um, and Fabian, a very young head coach, but again, I think that when he's had conversation with prospective players, they're really bought into his ideas and that conversation's gone really well. Um, th there's no doubt about that. And in terms of our processes of finding the right players for the football club, that continue, that's in continual improvement. We're improving those, those processes all the time, which makes the chance of any signings who come in to be a success. You know, in my view, our chance of those signings doing well is increasing year by year because of what we're doing internally. Yeah, I mean, I do feel that, um, especially at this, the highest level of the game in the Premier League, people expect to sign the finished product, but we don't, we actually give people minutes to get better. And I don't think many, many uh, teams offer that in the Premier League. Yeah, I think a lot of the players we do bring in, they may be young players, but they are at the level now. The great thing when they're young is they've got room for improvements. We bring in a really top player and then they improve with their environment, with Fabian's coaching, and then you end up with a world-class player. That's what our aim is. You've talked in the past, Tony, about how poker, being a brilliant poker player, equipped you with decision-making skills and good football business skills. I wonder, do you enjoy the cut and thrust of transfer dealing? Um, it's quite challenging at times. And you're often looking to bring in players, really top players from that particular club or that particular league. And a lot of the time they're not wanting to sell that player. Sometimes the club realises they need to and then it's a negotiation on price. But sometimes they really don't want to lose them. So it's tough and it's only getting tougher. Um, you know, when a Premier League club, any club, comes in, for a player, the price naturally seems to go up. Um, and so it, 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 we haven't always got the cards, um, the best cards to play. Sometimes we do, some circumstances allow, you know, we've got, always got to be opportunistic for, uh, for situations. So yeah, look, we, we know how it all operates and we're very uh, well attuned to it, but it can be tough. Um, but what we always make sure is we, we never have one player that we need to get at all costs. There's either a, a few different players we may go for, and if there's a particular position, although we want to uh, improve, if we can't get one of the few players, then we've always got within the building uh, players who can play. So we never go after one player at all costs, and that's really important because otherwise you've got a bad poker hand. Right, okay. Well, which gives you more pleasure, paying less for a player than you were willing to pay or getting more for a player than you expected to get? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're both good and they're both tough to get. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to ask, obviously, we've made a lot of signings over this transfer window, but at what financial level do you step in? When it comes to the transfer window and players in and players out, you know, I'm, I'm very involved in, in, in discussions with the David and Mike Cave. And is, is that at all levels, basis. down to the 23 level? Yeah, obviously the lower levels you go down, I'm aware of it and there's conversations, but I'm much less involved, at, you, know, at, um, you know, when it's academy level and certain levels, you know, when it comes to sort of you know, under 18s, under 16s, I'm not really involved there, but certainly under 21 level, I'm, uh, I am involved. Uh, they keep me informed of the situation. We have discussions, but less so, much more obviously when it's first team level or big transfer fees. Yes. These figures you see for transfer spending, they don't take into account how much you've, you've brought in, do they, very often? But 
Nevertheless, only Chelsea spent more in this transfer window. I mean, it would be fair to say that it took people by surprise, didn't it, to see Brighton so active in this, in this window. Nobody really saw that coming, did they? Yeah, I, I would imagine so. I don't, you know, I'm not in other people's minds, but we just don't worry. We don't focus on that at all. We always think of our processes, what's right for Brighton and our Albion Football Club at any moment in time, and then we do what we need to do. We're always trying to improve. We've always got ambitions to be uh, better than we already are. It won't always be the case. We can't, you know, certainly when everyone looks at the finishing position at the end of the season, as that's what that year's been, we can't always get better and better. But at the start of any season, we always try and improve and, and be better, both in terms of the squad of players and obviously the finishing position. And, and, and obviously domestic cups, which we always take seriously, we always want to do well and we, we hope at the start of any season that winning a domestic cup competition is possible and we always look forward to those um, a lot. It sends a really strong message, doesn't it? Because, you know, people outside the club might have started to say, well, unfortunately, Brighton do have to sell their top players every now and again to keep the business rolling and because those players have ambitions and big clubs come in for them. But by, by doing this in this transfer window, you've really made a statement about the strength of the business and the strength of the club, haven't you? Yeah, I think over the last few years, things have changed somewhat and we have got a lot stronger financially. And so, you know, ambitions, our ambitions continue to rise. Um, but I think literally like any club in the world, apart from maybe one or two, um, your best players are vulnerable to, to leave. And we don't have a problem with that. It's not like we want them to leave, but if they want to leave and we get the right offer, we, we will not stand in their way. And then we've obviously got young players coming through. We can invest in other players. Or we sometimes bring in, um, as you've seen this transfer window, a player straight into the first team. Did we get everyone we, we were after in the transfer window? We didn't get absolutely everyone we were after. We got almost everyone we were after, which is a pretty uh, good hit rate. So I'm absolutely delighted with the transfer business we've done, with the players we've brought in. Um, for what I've seen so far, it's still early days. They're fitted into the group, the environment. I know we haven't seen some of the players uh, play and, and obviously, you know, hugely disappointed with that horror challenge. See only Matt O'Reilly for a few minutes, but he had his operation say that's been successful. So really looking for, forward to seeing him back some point latter part of, of the year and um, you know I think it's really important to bring the right players in not just top quality players that goes without saying but the right players with the right personality fit for our football club and from what I've seen from what I've heard everyone has fitted in and it's really new for some of the players we've just signed last week but it, it you know it looks really positive from where I'm seeing things at the moment. How big is that when, when you go to sign a player Obviously, I think everyone can, can identify a player and their skill set on the field, but how important is their personality when it comes to bringing someone to the football club? Yeah, we look at that in a good amount of detail. That is really important. So lots of things have to be right to bring any football player in, in, into our club. Uh, and obviously the ability, um, how the head coach sees them fitting in. And there's obviously a... You know, the transfer has to be right, the player salary obviously has to be right, they've got to want to come, we've got to deal with the agent. But their, their fit, their personality their, um, is really important. How they're going to fit into our environment, how they're going to get on with our players and what they're going to bring to the club, not just in terms of on the pitch, which is really important, but off the pitch as well. And after what has been probably the most exciting transfer window in the club's history, now the work begins, doesn't it, for, for the next one and, and the, the second and the third one. Is it true that there's an ever-evolving list of players that we keep an eye on throughout the years? Yeah, we're always looking um, for many future transfer windows. So there's a lot of players that we're consistently looking at and that doesn't stop. That's uh, all year round. Um, as I said before, we've done a lot of business this transfer window, so I'm not expecting that much in the next two or three transfer windows, um, even if one or two of our key players go, because we have such strength coming through. It's a challenge to a new manager, any manager, to manage this uh, at the high level of integration, isn't it? And, and new people coming in and, and, and keeping them all happy and developing them all. 
When you chose um, Fabian Herzler, did you see those qualities in him, a sort of ability to work with players and manage people's expectations and, and integrate players, you know, new players? Yeah, that is one significant element of, of, uh, of the head coach. It's one which we weren't so sure about because we hadn't seen too much. But when we chatted with him, he was very calm. Um, it doesn't get too emotionally high, too emotionally low, which I think is a positive. I mean, it is good to show emotions. And sometimes when, yeah, goals happen, last minute winners, everyone's going to be very exuberant. But generally in his day-to-day -day business, he's calm, which is really important. It's a really tough start. He's come in to a new country, you know, a new league, a new club, and it's the best league in the world. The fact that he speaks really good English is a big advantage, but it's still very tough. And then we've got lots of transfer activity, lots of new players coming in, lots of discussions about that. We try for him not to get too involved. You know, his main role is just with the players he's got, with the coaching, with the tactics. But obviously, naturally, he's going to be involved with the players we've got coming in. You know, he needs to be aware of them. He needs to speak to them. And that has gone a lot better than I could ever have envisaged. Um, his demeanour, his ability to communicate with everyone, with, with his players, with his staff and with the media, that's all gone better than I could have hoped for. You'd certainly have settled for a 3-0 win at Everton, a home win over Man United <laughs> and a draw, at, a draw at Arsenal when you appointed him, when you were in the first month. Yeah, look, the, the, start, the first three games we thought were, were tough. Uh, we're always confident in any game we go to, but we know how tough the Premier League is. And those, that group of three games for Fabian's first three games in the Premier League were very tough. So, you know, we would be fine if they hadn't gone so well, but it's a real big boon, a big bonus for Fabian and for the whole club that we've started the season so well. Because you just know what external pressures can bring. We Internally, we can handle those things. We know the Premier League is always pressure. We like to think that as a club, you know, there's less pressure on us than there are on other clubs, but we know there's pressure. So the fact that we've started the season so well, you know, I'm really delighted for Fabian and everyone at the club. You've obviously appointed and worked with a, a lot of managers now. Uh, does Fabian remind you, has he got any attributes of a former manager? Just because when you described him there, you said he never gets too high, never gets too low. And that really reminds me of Chris Hewton. He was very much on that even keel. No matter how many you won, how many you lost, he was always going to be the same. Yeah, I mean, Chris you know, was very stable emotionally you know, in, in those things, which I think is, is really good. And Graham was to some extent as well. Roberto had other qualities, but he certainly had his emotional highs and lows, and everyone's different. Uh, and, and that can have benefits as well. But certainly, yeah, in that, in that regard, he's, he's more similar to Chris and Graham as well. I guess, just going back to the, the transfer trading, we ought to mention Paul Barber and David Weir because the people wouldn't see the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes. And Paul Barber's contract's been extended to 2030. I mean, how kind of invaluable is it to have a chief executive, a, chief, a guy in a chief executive role who can, who can work that well and that consistently at that level? It's a, it's a great benefit to you, isn't it? Yeah, as I've said many times in the past, I'm personally, and us as a club, are extremely fortunate to have Paul Barber as our chief executive. The fact that he and I get along so well is, is a huge bonus on top of that. But I can rest easy knowing that he's on top of all the details of everything at our football club. And there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of things going on all the time. And because we're a Premier League club or even any football club, it's in the public domain. So if anything goes slightly wrong or anything is there, you know, the media get to find out about it often and so he's a, you know he's exceptional in so many ways and on top of that a really safe pair of hands to run to run our football club um, and in terms of the transfer window it's been a really busy window so huge credit to obviously David Weir Mike Cave who's just come in when Sam Jewell went to Chelsea He's uh, running the recruitment for the men's team. He's overseeing the women's team. He's still assistant technical director to David. So lots of other roles as well. So he's worked phenomenally well uh, and hard over the last three months. And there's so many other people, all the scouting team, uh, people who do a lot of research, and also our legal and finance teams. There's you know, many, many different deals happening. You know, it's transfers in, it's transfer deals, it's player terms, you've got to deal with the agents, and then sometimes those players get loaned out. So there's another deal, another club to deal with. And, and 
everything has to be done right. And, and our uh, club secretary as well, sort of been really busy. So there's, a, there's many people who I have to personally thank and we as a club have to thank for allowing the transfer window to, to go so successfully. And that's on the men's side and the women's side, it's been almost as busy. We've got 10 new players coming in, coming in and you know that team with Dario, our new head coach, that's really exciting as well. And all, all the people that you mentioned behind the scenes, obviously they don't get quite the plaudits that the first team do, but it's so important to have that, fi- that foundation for the likes of Fabian to come in. Because I, I always look at managers that come into the football club and they do well and they get lauded for doing well. And I always think, but everything's here and in place for them to do well. And the people that you've mentioned there, they are that foundation that allow the manager to come in and concentrate with the players on the grass. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, it is so important that we lay the foundations and we've got the environment here that if any head coach comes in, that he can really focus on what we brought him in. So he's, any head coach we bring in these days, they're going to be an elite head coach. But we want to give them an environment to show those credentials, what they can do, working with the players, improving the players every day, the training facilities, and, and everything around works so they don't have to worry about a lot of the other things. And, and it's just everyone at the football club makes it what it is. So I was talking about the people who have really helped you in the transfer window, but there's so many other people at the training ground and also at the stadium and the support services and there's many, many roles, the ground staff, that make the club what it is. Uh, and not forgetting as well the Albion Foundation and all the the magnificent work that gets done there in the community. And that makes a big difference. They all have a, a role, sometimes some, some are small roles, but they all make a, big, make a difference at the end of the day to allow us, you know, on a Saturday afternoon, to compete at the highest level. And I suppose we should ask why we've got you here. With the, the amount of money that the football club spent in this transfer window, I'm sure there's a few fans out there have a slight concern, but we are in a healthy place when it comes to PSR. We're in a very healthy place with PSR. It's done over three years, got no concerns there. The rules are likely to change in the future, will it be season by season, but I can assure everyone that, um, that we would always stay within any financial rules that are set by the Premier League. That process you just described of getting all the right people in the right places, good people in, in, in the right jobs, was that always a, a kind of business idea of yours? Or did you learn that here? Or did you have it in your original business as well? Yeah, I think it's always been a, the right philosophy of mine. I mean, mo- any business, I think, is it, it, pretty a basic thing. It's not easy always to have, but, but that should always be, you know, any business owner, any CEO, uh, any board of directors should be thinking along those lines. To get to that position has taken a number of years. And in the early days, certainly, we, we wouldn't have got everything perfectly right. It takes a, a bit of um, experience sometimes to get that, that right thing and we certainly to have the budget to do that initially we need to get to the championship to have a bit more budget and obviously the Premier League is where we're always aiming where you have got uh, enough revenues that you can actually invest uh, properly in facilities and staff and long-term planning which is a really important thing uh, of, of the football club. Yeah because there are people out there in, in business and so on looking at you and your model your business model and how you operate and thinking how the hell does Tony Bloom do that? I wish I could. I wish I could learn some of that. He's kind of good at it. Yeah, he's, he's good at it. What, what can I learn from Tony Bloom? You know, do you, do you, sorry, do you get people asking you all the time for tips? You know, and advice. Uh, occasionally, yeah. I think one of the main things is long-term planning. That people who get involved in football clubs, it's often it's the here and now, and it's the first team, and it's the players, and don't worry about their ages, don't worry about the transfer fees. It's just getting promoted or getting into Europe. You know, uh, and I take a different view and I take a long term view and, you know, you've got to do it in small steps incrementally, look to continue to improve in all aspects. And you can do that in lots of small steps, but over a number of years, you can get into a much, much stronger position. Uh, And the other key thing is obviously bringing in the right head coach and the right players. And it's easier said than done. Um, But that's where we spend a lot of time, because if you've got the right players and not, as we've talked about, not just top ability, but the right characters that will get you 
a long way. And that helps everything else of the football club. That helps, you know, if the football club's doing well, that helps bring fans in, helps revenues there, helps commercial, more partners want to be involved in you. So it really starts, you know, with the first team players, but then that helps obviously with everything else, including the whole academy where we've invested for many, many years and we're starting to get lots of um, fruits of that, you know, investment. So I, I just want to jump in. You mentioned long-term planning there. And all those years ago, when you took over the football club, was this a secret kind of long-term plan for you to, to reach these heights, or was it more of a dream? Certainly we had long-term plans. Well, I remember when I took over, I think, Glenn, we, we met up in the summer. I think you were looking potentially to have a move, and I, I, I'm sure I talked a little bit about long-term planning. I may have talked about the Premier League, and certainly the Premier League was was always a long-term plan in terms of building the stadium and then soon after uh, taking over, getting uh, the site for a top quality training ground where we could get Category 1 Academy status. Um, so I think that was always there. And then obviously you want to get to the Premier League and stay there. Beyond that, back in 2009, I wasn't looking beyond that. Obviously, as, as time evolves and as soon as you get into the Premier League, you've got to be aiming higher and higher. And those first couple of seasons, um, as I'm sure you remember, it was all about staying there. Um, you know, and it wasn't until maybe the third season that we were looking beyond that. We've got to have, you know, a, a vision just beyond staying in the Premier League, however tough it was. And, you know, seven years in the Premier League, you know, we are established member of the Premier League. We don't take that for granted. We know how tough it is. I mean, this, this set of 20 teams, as is high quality the Premier League has ever seen, maybe similar to two seasons ago. I mean, 19 of the 20 teams are the same. Uh, but we always have to aim high, have strong ambitions. I think it was 2020 you know, when we uh, publicly set out our long-term vision for, them, for the men's team to be consistently top 10 and for, for the women's top four. I mean, th that ambition back when you took over the football club, for the state that the football club was in at that moment in time, was huge. Yeah, I, I, I get that, but you've got to, you know, you've got to be doing, you've got to be having those ambitions, and you know, building the stadium. It was a joy to to to, to see the the stadium being built. Um, as it was then, 22,500. As I knew back then, we were soon going to get it up to 27,500. And then as it transpired, you know, the demand was there. So we got to 30, 31, and now just over to 32,000. But you've got to be ambitious um, because otherwise, what's the point? We're not going to, I wouldn't want to be spending that amount of money to be in the Championship or League One. So, you know, whether it, it came to fruition or not, you've got to be aiming high. And I think that's true for, for a lot of these clubs outside the Premier League. When, you, when the club spends you know, 30 or 40 million pounds on a player, do, do you think that raises the expectation of selling clubs? So in other words, will they become harder to deal with now? Will they say to themselves, well, Brighton is spending more, therefore we're going to push them harder in a negotiation. Is that going to test your negotiating skills even more, do you think? Well, I think, I think it's always been like that. I think it's hard when you're in the Premier League. Uh, you know, and I think the last two years have, have not been easy when we're trying to purchase players but I think that's true of all Premier League clubs and, and almost true of any club any club who's got a, uh, a wanted player is going to negotiate hard so um, I, I think we just take that and accept the fact that some clubs will not want to sell their players or make the price too high and then we move on as I said we're never going to be uh, beholden to, to any one club or any one player. Is Joe Pedro a, a good example of everything going right in your process? Because, you know, you paid a fair amount for him, but already he looks to be way more, worth more, way more than you spent for him. Um, is he a classic example of good recruitment, good development, good potential, good future for this club? I mean, you must be very satisfied with the Joe Pedro <laughs> acquisition. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Joe Pedro is uh, a superb player. He's fitted in brilliantly when we bought him. Well, he's still young. Um, those are the sorts of players we like. He's at, he was at a high level when we, when we bought him and he's improved since then. Um, you want that to happen to all the young players you buy. It won't always be like that. But for, for sure, I mean, he's been a tremendous purchase. Uh, we love having him at the club and um, 
you know, he's a key player for us. You've signed a lot and you've been in charge of a lot of players over your time at the club. Any favourites? I'm not I, fishing. I, I'm not fishing, by the way. No, or actually, where, before you won the football club and, and when you were still a fan. Yeah, from, from I don't like to talk about individual players too much in terms of favourites since I've been here. But when I was growing up, 70s, uh, early 80s, when I was young, I mean, the, the players, I mean, Mark Lawrence was probably the best player I'd seen growing up. But he obviously he went before I'd seen him play that often. So the two I remember the most were Peter Ward and Brian Horton, who were the key players in, in, those, in those days. Brian Horton as our captain, um, played all the time. I don't ever remember him getting injured. And Peter Ward just, obviously, the, 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 when you're young, the person who puts the ball in the net, the ones you remember most. That's why you've got so many fans. <laughs> I don't know about that. What era have you enjoyed the most at the football club? Or who's here, could I say, which manager? I think the last, well, the whole, yeah, the, the year we got promoted for sure, because that getting into the Premier League, we got so close in previous seasons. So the actual, that season and getting up has got to be right up there because we'd worked so hard for that moment. And as, as you know, we were up there all the season, I think, um, all season long, I was confident. I remember, I think the goal you scored at the end of the match against Birmingham, I think it was, just before Christmas. It was that goal. I thought, that is it. We will definitely get promoted. That's when it was for me. I mean, obviously, we still had a long way to go. But I was, I, that was the moment I became really, really confident we'd get promoted. Look, I think the Premier League era, playing in the Premier League against the best players, the best teams in the world... Um, the first two or three seasons we would have a struggle, but we stayed up. I mean, that in itself was a, a, a monumental effort and a big achievement. But the last three or three or so seasons, um, where we were playing such good football um, and really competing and doing well against some of the best teams in the world, that's probably it. You went a long way to hire a um, women's manager to Australia, in fact. <laughs> Dario came with a very good reputation. What was it about him that um, attracted you to him? Yeah, the search for a head coach for the women's team. And we had a good amount of time. There's a long off-season. So we took a lot of time in terms of that. When we met with Dario, he had the right qualities uh, in terms of uh, what we thought the women's team needed and the players that we had and, and the recruitment we were about to do. We thought it was just an excellent fit, very down to earth, what you'd perhaps envisage a typical Aussie would be. And, you know, he got on really well with the people that he had a chat to, David, Mike, Zoe and Michelle. Um, and I think we instantly after meeting with him, we'd obviously done a lot of research beforehand. You know, the feedback I got was, yeah, this is... This is the guy, that he will be a really good fit for us. He'd done really well, obviously. We looked at his results, how we'd got on in Australia. And we have not been disappointed. He's come in, he's been a breath of fresh air, and he's got on really well um, with the women who, who have been here. And, you know, we've recruited 10 uh, new players. That's a lot. So there's a lot of settling in process for them. Um, but I'm excited for the season ahead. I think um, we've got, a really good set of players and I think we're going to have an excellent season. Um, the caveat to that is the Super League as a group of 12 teams has improved a lot. So, you know, you have to improve just to stand still. I think we've done more than that. But I think the Women's Super League is definitely becoming um, easily the best league in Europe and it's competing with the US League as the best league in the world. When we spoke to um, Dario Vidicic, he was, he was incredibly clear about what he wanted to do. And it reminded me of speaking to Fabian Herzler in a way. You know, the, you're hiring people and young managers have to be really clear, don't they? They're very, he's very articulate, very calm. So he reminded me actually of Fabian Herzler, Herzler a little bit. So you've, you've hired two similar coaches in some ways, haven't you? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. It's probably not the biggest coincidence in the world. But I mean, I've not had much to do with Dario, but the things I've heard about him and when I've heard him... Um, in the media, there are definitely similarities 
between him and Fabian. And, um, you know, uh, we are one football club. And there's, although the, the men's and the women's are, are quite separate in a ways, some of the processes that we are looking to do, you know, whether it's with recruitment and certain other areas, you know, we are looking um, for both the men's and the women's to to understand what each other's are doing and you can always there's always areas okay. to learn we understand you're extremely busy so thank you for joining us on the pod and thank you for your wonderful insight of your football club